All right, good evening, community. How are we doing? Good, good, good. I'll tell you what, here's what I want you to do to get you started. Everybody take out your phone, all right? Just go ahead and take out your phone. Most of you have a phone. And I know most places you go, they say, you know, t- put your phones away, silence your phone. No, we're not going to ask you to take out your phone. You can go to, just kind of wave it at me so I know you got your phone out there. Okay, very good. Okay, here's what I'm going to do to get us started. I'm going to ask you a few questions, and you can just uh, kind of vote by raising your phone, all right? You can just acknowledge and say, yep, that's true of me by raising your phone. Here's, here's the first question. You know what? I love this phone. I love my phone. I love my phone. Raise your hand. Raise it up there. I love my phone. Okay, a whole bunch of people loving, loving, loving their phones. <laughs> Very good. Um, how many of you go like, you, you know what? No, I hate my phone. How many of you go like, no, I hate this thing. I have it, but I, ha- I hate it. How many, okay, now last one though, and, and this is kind of where I'm going to fall. How many of you say, you know what? I love and hate this thing. Love and, there you go, love and hate this phone, right. I love it and hate it. Part of the reason is I love it because it gives me accessibility to the whole wide world. And I hate it because it makes the whole wide world accessible to me. So I'll tell you what, here's what I want to do something. I want to try, um, I'm just calling this an accessibility experiment, all right? So take your phone, still got your phone there? Go ahead and turn it on. Everybody turn it on. We're doing the exact opposite of everything you're told to do. Turn it on and turn it to loud. Turn it to loud. Go ahead and turn it on. Turn it to loud. And um, I have a prize. It's certainly no turducken, okay? It's it's a a gift card to the the, the, the Yellow Box Cafe. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to call somebody else in the room. The first person to be able to call somebody else in the room, and that person actually gets the call, and they stand up and wave at me, I will give you a gift certificate to the yellow box. So go ahead and do that. You have to stand up and wave. Oh, there we go. Who's your call from? I got Sabrina. <laughs> All right, very good. Let's give her a hand there. Nicely done. That took about two seconds, and there's your, there's your gift. Here, the reason I want, yeah, better go ahead and turn them off now. Here we go. The reason I want to do this is because, you know what? Ten years ago, we couldn't have done exactly that. 25 years ago, it's absolutely impossible because guess what? We all left our phones on the wall back at home. But today, we are accessible 24-7, and it's all Marty Cooper's fault. Right? That Marty Cooper. You're going, who's Marty Cooper? I'm glad you asked. Thank you very much. Marty Cooper's a guy who was born and raised here in Chicago. He went to college at Illinois Institute of Technology, graduated a degree in engineering, got an engineering job at Motorola, and got involved in innovation at Motorola. Marty Cooper was the guy who asked the question that ultimately made all of us accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And here's the question he began to ask. He asked this question. Why is it that when I want to call and talk to a person... We have to call a place. Why is it that we want to call and talk to a person? We have to call a place. And so Marty began to stir on this question. And over time, okay, he's asking this question in an era where every phone looks something like this. Okay, some of you remember this. Remember it was tethered by a squiggly cord to the wall. And eventually, he figured out how to call a person and not just call a place. And that led to the invention of this, the Dynatech 8000X. <laughs> Did anybody have one of those bricks? Anybody? Yes? Yes? Oh, yeah. Okay. It didn't exactly fit in your pocket, did it? No, not at all. And then eventually, right? Eventually it evolved, and we got these nice things. Remember the flip phone? I remember my first Razor flip phone. I thought it was like Captain, you know, Kirk from Star Trek, like beam me up Scotty. That was so cool. We got that. And today we have this magnificent wonder of technology. And I think for a lot of us, we do. We love this thing. There's also a part of us that kind of hates this thing because we are more accessible than any people in human history. Research tells us that we actually check these phones 221 times a day. We will check this every 4.3 minutes. And and even as I say that, I'm going like, yeah, that seems about right. About every 4.3 minutes, sure. We check them at work. We check them at home. We check them in the bathroom. Yeah, okay. And so some of you are some of you are going like, oh, you know you do. You know you when you're in the bathroom. Sometimes you go like, oh, I wonder what's going on on Facebook. I wonder what's happening on Instagram, right? Come on. Do you? You know you do. I, I, this week I was traveling. I, I, walked, I walked into the, into the men's bathroom in, in an airport. And there was a guy at a urinal doing whatever you do at a urinal. At the same time going, oh. I'm like, come on. 
Right, talented, someone says. Okay, well, there you go. Right. Who says guys can't multitask, right? There you go. Here's where we're headed with this big idea, okay? Maybe you're going, where are we going with this thing? You are accessible. I'm accessible. We're all accessible. But here's the one thing I want you to wrestle with is, are you available? Are you available? Because being accessible is fundamentally different than being available. Being accessible and being available, those are two different things. Now, this became vividly apparent to me a couple of months ago. It was during Hurricane Harvey down in Houston. Uh, this is where I heard this story. A, a lady was stuck in her, in her garage with her husband, her two dogs, and her disabled uncle. In a panic, she calls 911. They said they're going to send someone to help. 30 minutes pass, nobody shows up. An hour goes by, nobody shows up. And meanwhile, the water is rising, it's now ankle deep, and, and they have no higher place to go with their disabled uncle. Two hours pass, and now it's knee deep. Another hour passes, three hours, and now the water's getting close to being up to their waist and still no emergency help. Here's the point, 911 was accessible, but it was not, what? Available, Available. that's exactly right. Well, and thankfully, she, was, she actually ended up calling ABC News, and they were able to send somebody, and they actually, they actually did rescue her. There's a big difference, and we got to get this, between being accessible and being available. And what I wonder, just relationally, okay, this is where we're going to take the turn. I wonder if relationally, we are becoming a people who are accessible to one another, but not really available to one another. And, and the problem is not technology, the problem is not social media. And I'm, I kind of get tired of people blaming stuff on technology and social media. Technology and social media are just a, yet another in a series of tools. Tools that happen to make us, if we decide to use them, more accessible. They are not the problem. They're a tool. The problem is me. Because oftentimes, I am accessible, but am I available? And, and that's why we're starting this, this new series. I think this is gonna be a really important series for a whole bunch of us. It's a brand new series we're calling Next Level. And it's all about taking a biblical look at our relationships and our friendships. And how do we take those most important relationships, those most important friendships, and how do we take them to a brand new, kind of better place, what we'd say to the next level? Because there is inside of us, we have a desire. We have a, a, a longing, universally, all of us, for, for relationship and friendship. Brene Brown, who's a, he's a brilliant thinker and, and, and gifted writer, she, she, put it, she puts it this way. She says, we are hardwired. We're hardwired this way to connect with others. It's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. And then she goes the other way and says, in fact, without it, without friendships, without these relationships, there is suffering. We will suffer. The Apostle Paul just reinforces it in different languages, a different metaphor. But he basically, he says, we are designed for community. We are designed for relationships. We are designed for friendships. And as a community of Christ followers, we are going to be connected together in a meaningful way. He explains this in Ephesians 4, 6, using kind of the body analogy. He says this, from him, from God himself, the whole body, that we are this body. And we're joined and held together by every supporting ligament. Well, that's how our relationships come together. And, and we grow when we build our, we, ourselves up in love together, only as each part does its work. And one of the things that we're gonna push, we're gonna push you a little bit in this series. Because if you wanna have friendships and relationships that go to the next level, it really, what Paul's saying here, as each part does its work. And so during this series, we're gonna talk about how do you move from not being just accessible, we're all accessible, we've proven that to actually being available. And then from available to being authentic and from authentic to being accountable. All right? And that's, that's where we're headed. And, and um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a story in, in Mark chapter two. This is, it is just a brilliant, brilliant story. And if you're not familiar with the story, you gotta go back and reread this, or I'm gonna encourage you later on to jump in a small group where you can kind of take a deeper dive on this thing. But I wanna look at Mark chapter two, the Gospel of Mark chapter two, and it's the story about, uh, about, the, about these friends. So let's go ahead and skip on to the next uh, Mark chapter two. There we go. It's, I'll read it and then we'll kind of unpack it together. It says this, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So now there's this buzz. There's a buzz about Jesus being, in, being back. And, and people are excited about this. And so many people actually gathered there 
There was no room left, not even outside the door. And as Jesus preached the word to them, so some men came bringing to Jesus a paralytic carried by four of them. Well, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, what they did instead is they made an opening on the roof above Jesus. And then after digging through it, they lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. And then when Jesus saw their faith, he actually said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Okay, I want you to kind of think through this story a little bit. Picture this scene, okay? The scene is this, there's a paralyzed guy. The paralyzed guy has a, has a very obvious need. And he has this group of friends. He has this group of four friends and they hear that Jesus is gonna be in town that Jesus is swinging by, and, and they want to go see him. They wanna, they wanna listen to him. They, they would love the opportunity to meet Jesus. And perhaps, perhaps for their friend, he might even do one of those miracles they've heard so much about. And so they're talking to their friends, saying, hey, let's, go, let's go meet Jesus. And the paralyzed friend, I would imagine him going like, no, 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 no I'm, I, I, look at this, I'm not, I'm not going. And they're going, yes, you're going. He said, no, I'm not going. Yes, you're going. And finally, all four guys grab the mat, and they begin to pull him through town. Now I'm imagining as they got him on this mat, this paralyzed guy, and they're taking him to Jesus. I'm imagining it's kind of an awkward kind of scene as they're navigating through town trying to get him there. But eventually they get to the home where they hope they get a chance to meet Jesus. They hope that their friend gets a chance to meet Jesus. And this place is just packed. It's not only, not only is the house full, but there, there's people all around it kind of leaning into the windows, leaning into the door, trying to hear a little bit of what Jesus is gonna say. So what do we do now? That's what the friends are going, well, what do we do now? Do we, do we, do we wait and, you know, until everybody kind of leaves and maybe we'll, then we'll get a chance to talk to Jesus? No. Do we just maybe just forget it? Maybe it's another time? My theory is this, that in every group of friends, okay, think about your group of friends, there's always one, right? There's always one who's got an idea. Always one. And so I have a hunch that one of the four says, hey, I got an idea. What if we get up on the roof. And the other three are looking at him, plus the paralyzed guy going like, what do you mean get up on the roof? What do you mean get up on the roof? And, there's, and the one always will respond with this. Here's what they always say. See if this is true in your friend group. Just trust me. <laughs> right? There's always, just trust me. So the next thing you know, they're trying to figure out a way. They, 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 on the mat, they get this paralyzed guy up onto the roof. All four friends. They begin to dig okay, into the roof. And I'm imagining, so Jesus is teaching inside there and all of a sudden plaster starts falling from the ceiling, right, on the people. And, then, uh, and also there's this little hole and this little hole starts to get a little bigger and a little bigger. And pretty soon there's this mat that's being lowered down. And imagine it just all of a sudden if here, all of a sudden something comes out of the ceiling, lowered down right in the middle of you right there. And it's a paralyzed guy on a mat. And that's what happened. All of a sudden, this guy is smack dab right in the middle of this room. And, and there he is. He's looking at Jesus. Jesus is looking at him back and forth. I think that my favorite part of the scene would probably be when, when Jesus kind of looks up. <laughs> and there's four sets of eyes that look back down <laughs> at him, right? And so here it is. They've gotten their friend to Jesus. It's not in the, it's not in the text, but I kind of imagine... I imagine at this point that Jesus kind of shakes his head, looks at the four friends, and then looks at the paralyzed guy, and then he says that, son, your sins are forgiven. And I love what it says here. Look at this part. It says, when Jesus saw, what's it say right there? Say it out loud. What's that say? Their faith. Their faith. When Jesus, who's he talking about? The four friends. When Jesus saw their faith, that's when he said to the paralyzed guy, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, this wasn't exactly what they came for, but it was exactly what he needed. It was exactly what he needed. Now, everybody there wasn't thrilled about this. In fact, the religious leaders, it says, it says they kind of were, were grumbling amongst themselves, saying, who does he think he is saying he forgives sins? Where does he get the authority to actually say, I'm forgiving your sins? He can't do that. Jesus kind of overhears them or at least senses their displeasure. And so he just takes on the religious leaders right there. Paralytic man there, everybody there. And here's what he says. He says, he says to them, and he says this to the religious leaders. Okay, then, which is easier to say to the paralyzed man? Your sins are forgiven? Or, would this be easier? To say, get up and take your mat and walk. And then he goes, 
To make the point, I want you to know that the Son of Man, myself, I have authority to, on earth to forgive sins. So watch this. So he says to the man, the lame man, the paralytic man, he says, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And in that moment, that paralyzed man stood up and he walked out of that house on his own two legs, a brand new person. His body was changed. He was healed. His spirit was changed. He was forgiven. His life was completely and totally changed. In fact, so much so, it's such a radical thing that happened. Here we are 2,000 years later, and we're still telling that remarkable story. Now, here's what I want you to get. And I think maybe this is why God has you here tonight, okay? I want you to think about your relationship. Think about your friendships. And here's what I want you to get. That man, that paralyzed man, he was forever changed because of the faith of his friends who were just simply available. He was forever changed by a group of friends and their faith who just made themselves available. See, here's what I find interesting about this story. The man on the mat, the paralyzed man, what he needed, he needed healing, right? He needed healing. He also maybe didn't realize this, he needed forgiveness. And as far as I know, there was, there was nothing special about this group of friends. This was not a group of doctors. This wasn't a group of certified EMTs. This was not a group of clergy or even pastors. This is just a group of friends who were what? Available. They made themselves available. There, there's a verse in the Old Testament that I always find super encouraging. When it, Occasionally I'll find myself some, somewhere and I, maybe, I mean, when it comes to mind, I, I'm in some foreign country and they've asked me to speak on something and I, I'm looking around and going like, what in the world am I doing here? What do I have to contribute? And you, you just kind of don't feel really qualified. And there, there's this verse in Second Chronicles that always comes to mind and I love this. And, and, and listen to what it says here. So the eyes of the Lord is ser- are searching the whole earth. Just picture that. God looks, just kind of searching the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And what this verse always reminds me is that God is, he's just kind of out there looking. He's looking for people who will be just available to him. He's searching the whole earth for anyone who will just be available to him. I I get the sense that that God is very kind of pragmatic, kind of like he's just going, okay, who's up? Who's up for this thing? Anybody? Who's available? Uh, It's kind of like... um, I heard Pastor Meeks talk about this at the Exponential Conference. He said, it's kind of, it's kind of like, maybe you're at home you're, and, you're, and you're starting to write something down. You need, you need to write something down. Maybe you're trying, you need to make a list or, or you got an idea you don't want to forget. And so you're trying to find a pen or you try to find a pencil and you can't find a pen or pencil anywhere. I mean, where, where, all the, where are they? And so finally you, you see a crayon, one of the kids' crayons. Out. So you grab the crayon and you use that to write out this list. Now, you grab the crayon. You don't grab the crayon and use the crayon because it's the best tool, but it just happens to be the one that's what? It's available. That's exactly right. I think it's kind of like that. Or you ever have a situation where you're at home, and um, right now, actually, in our, in our kitchen, one of our, one of our doorknobs is it's, it's, it's coming unloose, or maybe you have something that's coming uh, loose, and these, the screw needs to be tightened. And for the life of you, you can't find the screwdriver. You can't find a screwdriver. You're supposed to put them back where they belong. Well, nobody ever puts them back where they, where they belong. You can't find a screwdriver. So you go over to, the, to where the silverware drawer is, right? You open the silverware drawer and you pull out a, a butter knife, right? You get a butter knife. Now, a butter knife is not the best tool to use, right? But it happens to be the tool that is available. Exactly right. Or maybe, you know, you find yourself in the bathroom. You're in the bathroom. And you realize, oh, my goodness, there's no toilet paper. And nobody placed an extra one underneath the sink. And then you see about a year old issue of Better Homes and Gardens. <laughs> and you go, well, it's not the best tool, but it is exactly right. Here's what I want you to ask yourself in all seriousness, okay? Ask yourself this, okay? Will you make yourself available? Imagine if this is true, that God's just looking. Who's available? Who's up for this thing? Will you make yourselves available to that kind of a friend? I think there's a couple really important things we can learn from this story about moving from a very accessible culture to actually being available people to make a difference in the lives of each other. Here's, here's a couple things. Here's, here's the first one. Next level friends are available to carry each other's mats. Next level friends are available. They make themselves available to carry each other's mats. See, carrying that mat that had to be awkward, right? 
especially as you're walking through the city, it had to be awkward and kind of strange. And in the story, the mat, I think that represents all of our brokenness. All of us got, all of us, this is the thing we got to get over, all of us got parts of our life that are not working well. And sometimes we're afraid to get close to people because of their flaws, and we go like, well, I don't know what I would say, I don't know what I'd do. Or we're close, we're afraid to let them get close to us, because I don't want them to see my issues, I don't want them to see my shortcomings, my mat. But again, ask yourself, are you gonna be available for the kind of friendship where you carry each other's mats? I know, I know, I'll tell you, I know there's been key times in my own life when other people, you know, picked up the mat for me, and I, and I am grateful. I, I'm thinking of a couple times, I, I was a young newlywed and um, married, and I didn't, I didn't really have a, a good grasp on kind of personal finance stuff. There was a whole bunch of it that I just, I just, I don't know why I never got it. And I remember a couple in our small group a small group here at community. He went on and started his own business, did very, very well. I remember they, they pulled me aside and they began to explain some real simple kind of biblical financial principles to live by. And, I, and I've continued to try to live by them. And one of the things, they went above and beyond just teaching me. They also said, you know what, here's what I'm gonna do, Dave, to get you on the right track. For the next year, we're gonna send you 50 bucks a month for you to put into savings so you'll start saving money. What well, I'm gonna do for the next year because I want to, I want to, get, I want to get, get, you, get some momentum about this thing, some of the stuff he was teaching me. And you know what he was doing? I mean, what that couple was doing? Essentially, they, they were carrying my mat, weren't they? It was stuff I didn't get in my own life, and they were just there, hey, we're gonna be there for you. I remember soon, I, my wife and I going through a tough spot in our marriage uh, when the kids were young. And every, every marriage goes through these, where you, where you get, a, you go through, a, you know, a, a period where you're gonna go like, oh man, is this thing ever gonna get better, Right? I'm sure none of you guys do that. It's just me, okay? It's just, just me. None of you, forget it. So but we were going through it. And I remember talking to an older guy in one of my small groups. And he kind of explained, hey, every marriage goes through stuff like this. And he gave me some sage advice. And it was like in that moment, he just kind of picked up my mat and said, you know what? I'm gonna carry you. We all have mats, brokenness in our own lives. And hear me on this part. Hear me loud and clear. Someone else's miracle could be depending on your availability to pick up their mat. Think about that. Somebody else's miracle, what they need most, maybe just depending on you being available and willing to pick up their mat. Dan and Michelle, they lead a small group in our, at our Plainfield location. And uh, they did, were very intentional about making themselves available. Here's their story. My name's Dan Nawa. This is my wife, Michelle. We have three daughters, and we've been attending community for close to 20 years. For years of attending community, we knew what small groups were, but we never really um, looked into it too much. But I kind of felt like something was missing. We would um, talk to people in the hall after, or in the lobby after um, church services, and you know, we got to know people's names and um, a little bit about their stories, but. I felt like it was more on a, a basic level. I, I felt like we needed to dive in more. So when we finally did join a small group, it was life-changing. I felt like we belonged. We, um, we fit in so easily with the other families that we um, were part of a small group with. And, um, you know, we started praying for one another's families. You know, these people that I'm with, these people that you're, um, you know, sharing this journey with, you, they really are going through the same issues you are, you know, and it's, it's good to, you know, get it out and, and, and open yourself up because you get positive feedback and, you know, no one's judging you. They, you know, it, it brings out great conversation. We were both baptized and all of our children um, in the past few years at community and um, our small group was there to support us. One of the wives that's in our small group, um, she was right there with me when I got baptized and it was just the most amazing feeling. It's really been so beneficial having all of us there as a support group for each other. We're trying to all learn how to make God number one and then, then our marriage and then our kids and it's, we're all kind of on that journey together. It really feels like such a huge part of our lives that um, it'd be hard to think of our lives without that in it. So Jim and Carrie East have been with our small group from the start. They have two children, Tyler and Kylie, and um, Kylie was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis as a baby. Our small group didn't know anything about cystic fibrosis really um, until we met the East and um, started learning really what all it entails. Breathing treatments and, and the amount of medication that they have to give to Kylie um, you know, on a daily basis and, and 
the feeding tube and just everything that they undergo with her every day. And, um, you know, a lot of times in winter months, Kylie would have to be hospitalized. So we would really come together to support them um, as much as we could when they were going through those trying times. About four years ago, we started uh, working with them um, on a fundraiser every year called the Breath of Hope. Um, so we raise money for finding a cure for cystic fibrosis. Um, we've gotten our children involved over the years, and so every year for the past five years now, um, our families have all gotten together. I think it's important for the, the children to see too that you know we, we're making a difference and we're trying to find a cure. You take the time to decide what's important in your life and you make yourself available. I mean, there's stuff that you might not get to do or stuff that you had planned that you could you know cross off your off your calendar. But when stuff is important to us, you make the time, you make yourself available. That's good stuff. Here's the deal, next level friends. If we're gonna take it to the next level, you make yourself available to carry each other's mats. But the other thing, the second thing too, next level friends, they also, here's what they do, ultimately they bring each other to Jesus. They bring, isn't that what the four friends did? And think about that. I mean, there was, there was a physical brokenness in his life. And we all have brokenness in our lives, broken seasons or brokenness. And there's some times where we cannot get to God on our own. It is so hard for us because we're so stuck. And we need some other people to come around and say, you know what? No, we're going to get you there. We're going to get you there. That's why you need each other. That's why we need each other. Andy Stanley, I love almost everything this guy, when he teaches and he writes, but he, he makes this point, very simple but so true. He says this, your friends, think about this, okay? Your friends will determine the quality and the direction of your life. Your friends will determine the quality and direction of your life. And so with that in mind, I wanna give you a two-part challenge, okay? Number one, first challenge is this. Will you do this? Will you, okay, be available. Be available. Make yourself available. And I would challenge you, if you're gonna make yourself available, find a small group here at Community Christian. And what if you just gave it, give it, just give it four weeks? And you know what? Like carrying that mat, it might be kind of awkward at first. But if you give God a chance to work a miracle in your life or someone else's life, it happens as you make yourself available. Um, it, it, here's, what, here's a very, very practical next step. You can actually text this, go ahead and text this number, SG Info. SG Info to 313131. If you text SG Info to 313131, they'll get, send you a form and they'll give you a bunch of uh, options on that and you can, just, you can make a choice about a small group. But I would challenge you with that. Just four weeks, be available. If you're already in a small group, here's what I would say. Here's the second thing I would say then. Not only be available, but I'd challenge you to stay available. Stay available. Continue to carry the mats of those in your small group. Let them sometimes carry you. And remember this, somebody else's miracle could be depending on your availability just to pick up their mat. There is a um, kind of an old country storyteller and, and, uh, and preacher, a guy named Fred Craddock. And, and uh, before he passed away, there was, a, there was a story that he would often tell about a very special community of friends who had a very special tradition. And uh, the special tradition would revolve around whenever someone brand new would come into their community, they would always have a carry-in meal. Everybody would bring a meal, and they'd have a big meal together. Now, that wasn't the special tradition. The actual special tradition would actually happen after the meal. So they'd finish the meal, and after they finished the meal with a new person there, the new person would be at, at one end, and then they would all make a circle together. They'd all make a circle together. And so the, the new person would be there, and they would start with the person on the right. And the person on the right would say to the new person something like, well, hello, my name's John. Um... If you don't know, I, I, I work at the gas station on Main Street, and I'm really good with fixing cars. So if you ever have any car trouble, I just want you to know you can call me, okay? Then they go to the next person. And the next person might say something like, uh, hello, my name's Teresa, and I love to bake. I love to bake, and people love to eat what I bake. Best of all are my pies. And if you ever need... A, uh, a baking tip or if you need a pie for a special occasion, you just let me know. Then they go on to the next person. He might say, hi, my name's Bert. I do law here in town. Now, I hope you never need my services, but if you do, my office is right next to John's gas station. And they would just continue to go all the way around the circle, each person sharing like that. 
And it was that special tradition that made that group so special. And then Fred would always end the story this way. He said, and that special community had a name. You know what they called that circle of friends? They called it church. They called it church. Let's pray. Father God, um, I ask, I ask that uh, as accessible as we are 24-7, 365 days a year. I ask that you help us to be a people that are available. Help us to be a people that are available to you, for us to use you, but then also available to one another, to carry each other's mats, to love each other the way you meant for us to. Make us into the kind of community that you dreamed from the very beginning. And this is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.